Well, thank you for that update, Cora. We're so glad to have you back with us. And uh, yeah, just neat the way God works in and through our lives, isn't it? In every stage of our life, there is something that God um, wants to reveal. Well, um, let's just bow in a word of prayer before I get into the word this morning. Uh, Jesus, we just want to thank you and we want to praise you because of your faithfulness, Lord. You are faithful and true to your word, God. And Father, this morning we're entering into um, a scripture that outlines a real dark chapter in Israel's history. And Lord, I, I know that you have a purpose in in what you've revealed in your word for us, Lord, so that we can learn. So God, we just pray that you would open the eyes of our heart to see what it is that you would say uh, through this, God, through this message today, and that you give me strength um, to be able to speak it in the way that you would have me speak it, and that's, that's honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're wrapping up uh, my um, series of messages in a two-part mini-series on uh, the life of Samson. Now, I'm going to say, as a pastor, going into the judges and reading what's written there, there are some very disturbing things that happened in the history of Israel. And particularly during this time when Israel had no king, there were some very dark sagas that were, uh, were uh, outlined for us and, and the story was told for us. And sometimes I think we get it wrong. We, we get the wrong idea about what God's trying to say through this, these portions of Scripture. And last week I, I talked to you about the birth and the calling of Samson and how at this time in history, um, the Philistines, the Philistine nation, a nation of warriors, they were... Uh, they were given power over the people of Israel because of their great sins against God. Now, God, the people were openly worshiping idols. Um, they were adulterating themselves to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on one hand. On the other hand, they were bowing down and worshiping idols and, and practicing the practices of the Canaanites. And, and for many years, we see this vacillation that took place in Israel, they would, they, would, uh, they would start to worship idols and then they would be given over to the hands of oppressors and great oppression would come upon them and, and, and things were not going well so they cried out to the Lord and the Lord would have mercy and would send uh, someone to, to help them. He'd ra- the Lord would raise up a judge who would then be empowered to deliver Israel from their oppressors, and then once they were delivered from their oppressors, again, their eyes would get off of God, and they'd start to wander, and they'd start to go back to the way that they were doing things before, and started worshiping idols again. So you had this cycle over and over again, and each time that cycle came around, it kind of went down further and further and further, spiraling downward. So here we have... Uh, a scenario where Israel is given over to the oppression of the Philistines for 40 years, which at that time in Israel's history was unprecedented. And, And as always, as they normally had the pattern of doing, they would cry out to the Lord when the oppression came down on them and became nearly unbearable. So God, in his mercy, would hear their cries, and he would raise up a new judge. So we talked about last week about the, the birth and the call of Samson, and, and, and we see that before he was born, Samson was actually set apart to serve God as a judge. And we need to understand that when we think of judge, um, many people that are new to the Bible, when, you, when I say, well, God raised up a judge, right? Well, what picture comes to your mind? Well, for some, some... People might look at that and go, hey, that's a judge, you know, in their mind's eye. But, but what the, when the scripture is talking here with the Israelites, where God raised up a judge, he actually was raising up someone more like that to take care of problems that were occurring. So, um, so the judge raised up by Israel is kind of the picture of Samson. And, and Samson was the last judge that God raised up. He had visited uh, Samson's parents, 
and asked them to consecrate their son to the Lord and raise him as a Nazarite from birth. And he was to be set apart to start in the deliverance process of Israel from Philistine oppression. As a Nazarite, okay, the scripture tells us about what a Nazarite was. The vows that Samson took showed that were, were to show that he was serious about his commitment to be consecrated to the service of God for God's purposes. And, and he was to begin the uh, deliverance to be begin the, the deliverance of the Philistines or of the Israelites from the Philistines. And the Nazarite vow had three parts to it. First of all, he wasn't supposed to consume any wine, grapes, or grape products. That was one of the rules of the Nazarite. And, and he was to deny that part and focus his whole life upon God. And, and, and the next thing he was supposed to do was um, he was never supposed to touch any dead body of a human or animal. And finally, he was never to cut his hair. And the whole process I explained last week, um, for those who weren't here, it was an act to say that, God, you take my life and you take it in your direction. I don't want distractions from it. I don't want anything to do with impurity. I want to be consecrated to serve you. That's what the Nazarite vow is about. Now, um, with Samson in book in the, in, in the book of Judges, in chapter 14, Samson um, becomes a young man, and he, he raises up, and from, from the time he's little, there's something different about this guy. You know, there's definitely, the hand of God is upon him, but, but Samson, we see, as he gets into his adulthood, he breaks each of his Nazarite vows in succession. And, and Samson, we see, he didn't consecrate himself to the Lord the way that God had asked. But his heart was led astray, drawn to immoral behavior and disobedience to the law of Moses on almost every front. And as the story unfolds, we see he loses his consecration to God more and more as he steps further and further into sin. Step by step, we see him t move toward the consequences which will ultimately lead to his unraveling and the ultimate loss of his power and his capacity to be a leader and actually resulting in his death. In many ways, I was thinking about this, you know, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, God, why do you have this story in here? What, what are you trying to say through this? I think if you look at Samson and the life of Samson, there's a pattern developing um, where Samson actually was a representative. He was a, um, how would you say, uh, a shadow of what was taking place in the nation of Israel. But in many ways, it's a mystery. I'm reading it and I'm going, man, I know now why a lot of pastors never preach judges. I haven't heard a whole lot of ser sermons on judges in my life. I don't know about you, but I was looking at this. This is deeply, deeply disturbing. What's going on? I, I think Samson... What, what God's trying to say here is Samson is a reflection of what was taking place in Israel in the hearts of people. He's also a, a reflection of what's taking place in the sinful hearts of humanity in the rest of the world. How could God use a man like Samson? You know, it, it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma. It's like Billy Graham actually once said, um, that Samson was God's delinquent. And I think that's a pretty accurate description of him. Because when you start to read, and you see some of the terrible things that he participated in, and you're wondering, why is this, how, how is this going to happen? 
why is this, why is this happening the way it is? And, and God, why do you have this in the Word? Okay, well, there's some reasons for it, and, um, you know, I'm trying to consolidate this today in a sermon that's not going to keep you here for like five hours. But there's some really important lessons, I think, that God was trying to teach us through this story. So let's, let's, let's look at, a, at an example of this. I'm not going to go through everything in Samson. It goes through three chapters. But we're going to pick a couple of things out of here, out of, out of the life of Samson and talk about it. In, ja- in Judges chapter four, or 14, I, rather, verses 1 to 3, um, we're going to read the story of Samson's first big issue. So here it is, starting with verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among the people, among our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, folks, as a backdrop to this, many years before, um, when Moses was addressing the nation of Israel, before they had entered the promised land, they were out in the desert preparing to take hold of the promised land that God had, had prepared. And Moses knew when they entered the land of Canaan, when the people entered that land, there's going to be other nations that were living there. And they were possessing the land ahead of them. And those people in that land were worshipped other gods and they had practices of immoral behavior that, that if the people participated in, would take them far away from God's ideals. So, so in Deuteronomy chapter 7, 3 and 4, Moses actually wrote a law for the people. And Moses commanded them saying this, do not intermarry concerning the people of Canaan when they went into the land. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. So this was the law of Moses. So right off the cusp here, we see that Samson desires to do something that is in direct violation of a law that was given to them from Moses. And we continue reading in Judges chapter 14, 4. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and his mother. And as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. And then he went down and talked with the woman. And he liked her. Okay. So we see a couple of things unravel here in this story. So the mystery is that Samson was on his way to act disobediently towards God. He was on the way to do that in complete disregard for the law of Moses. And and despite his obstinate, foolish, and disobedient demeanor towards the Lord, God overlooked this, and, and when a lion attacked him, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson so that he was able to overpower the lion and, 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 and kill this thing with his bare hands. The strength that God gave him was such that he was preserved, even though he was going down to disobey the Lord. That's what he was doing. So what's up with this? What's up with this? God's, God's doing something. He's trying to show something. 
There's a way that re- seems right into a man. In the end, it leads to death. There's all kinds of occasions in Scripture where we see someone doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and God still has mercy on them and intervenes despite that person's foolishness. It's an enigma. Why would God protect Samson from the lion when he knew he was on his way to sin? Mystery deepens further when we see that the defeat of this lion also led to, indirectly, to Samson breaking one of his Nazarite vows. God, in his foreknowledge, knew that this would happen. And he was using the circumstances, nevertheless, of Samson's disobedience to accomplish his purposes in the end. See, this, the Nazarite was not supposed to touch any kind of dead body, including the body of a dead animal. When we read in Judges 14, 8 to 11, continuing, sometime later he went back to marry her, the woman that he liked, the Philistine woman that he liked. He went down to marry her, and he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. So he scooped out the honey with his hands and ate it as he went along, totally in disregard of his Nazarite vow, totally defiling himself in this way. But this is what he did. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate it as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they ate it too. But he didn't tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast, as it was customary for young men. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. So Samson not only defiles himself with the breaking of his Nazarite vow, just, oh yeah, whatever, we're going to do this. He knew that he wasn't supposed to do it, and he just did it without even blinking an eye. And then he holds, holds this bachelor party, and all these Philistine men are invited to this bachelor party to be with him as his companions, it's tradition. It's not stated directly what this feast entailed and what was going on in this feast, but you can just imagine you have a giant wedding feast with a bunch of Philistines. What do you think is going to be happening there, right? Not, not good stuff, right? There was probably alcohol flowing freely and all kinds of stuff happening. So in the middle of all this, because of his foolishness and getting into this situation, that he could have avoided in the first place by saying, yeah, Dad, you're right. Mom, you're right. I shouldn't be looking at a Philistine woman to be my wife. But instead of doing that, he goes along and does this. And God chooses to use this as a way to confront the Philistines. But what he says, see, he's in the middle of this bachelor party during the seven days somewhere. And he says, let me probably near the, end, near the beginning of it. Samson was, he liked to have fun, you know. Ah, this is an occasion for me to have some fun with these guys. So, <laughs> let me see. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can answer, give me the answer within seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Now, in those days, there wasn't a Walmart down the street, Right? All these clothes were valuable. Clothes were valuable because they're all handmade. So, tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days they could not give the answer. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Ooh, now it's getting nasty. Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing. You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. And no wonder she was so distressed. These 30 warrior guys are going to burn her house down and her father and her and everyone else in her family. This is distressing. This is still an indirect result of Samson's disobedience, isn't it? Yes, it is. Absolutely. So, Samson says this. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. 
And she, in turn, explained the riddle to her people. See, after this, his wife, she tells the Philistines, who were pressing her, the meaning of the riddle. And then they go and report it to Samson. Ha ha, we've solved your riddle. And he does this. All right, well, Samson, if he was a humble man, he would have gone, this is my fault. I've put a, us in this situation. No, he was not. Samson lost his temper. Oh, how dare they? Now I owe 30 sets of clothing. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to teach those guys a lesson. I'm going to go to a neighboring city, and I'm going to kill 30 men, and I'm going to take all the clothes off their bod- dead bodies and take it over the back to them and give them their clothes. They want clothes. I'll get them clothes. So he does that. Goes down. Kills 30 men. Takes their clothing. Comes back and pays to pay the debt that he incurred with his foolish riddle. And then when he gets there, he finds out that the woman that he married has actually been given to one of those guys that he was supposed to get the clothes for. Picture that. Oh, yeah. So his father-in-law thought he was just going to leave her. And then when he comes back with the 30 sets of clothes, oh, surprise, she's already been given away to another guy. Samson's consequences, like going, this is my fault. This is something that I've done wrong, and I'm facing the consequences of my bad decisions. Does he say that? Oh, no. Ah! Those Philistines, how dare they? My father-in-law, he's such a jerk. He gave my wife away. Father-in-law's like, Oh, yeah, I got this younger daughter here. Ah, oh, Samson, nice Samson, nice Samson. I got the daughter here that's even prettier than her sister. You, you know, you can have her as your wife. Oh, no, Samson's pride is wounded, so look out. So he goes out and he kills a bunch more Philistines and then retreats back into Israel and hides in a cave. So what happens past that? The Philistines are enraged by this. And um, they ended up <laughs> they ended up finding him. And uh, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you about uh, the fact that uh, he uh, t- before he went off and in, into the cave there, he caught three hundred foxes. And we don't it's not telling us how he caught them, whether he had traps or whether there was a fox farm in Philistia. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But he ends up catching five, uh, 300 foxes. Somehow, he gets them. We don't know. It doesn't say why or how. And then he ties them together, two by two, puts a torch between their tails, and sets them loose into the Philistines' agricultural area. <laughs> and these foxes run all over the place, lighting everything on fire as they go. It all burns down. It all burns down. And the um, Philistines are like, well, why did this guy do this? They're enraged because in that day and age, if you lose your crops, you're going to starve or it's going to be really hard for you the next year. So they're totally upset. And they're asking themselves, well, why did this happen? Why did this brute of a guy do this? You know, why did this warrior do this? Oh, it's because his father-in-law gave his wife to somebody else. Okay. Well, we'll teach them. So they go and they, uh, they burn his father-in-law and his wife. They burn them, kill them. Hmm. Did Samson go, oh, one plus one equals two? My sin resulted in all this horrible, horrible outcome? No. no. So he... Uh, He's mad, kills a bunch of people, and he goes back and hides in a cave in Israelite territory. And then the Philistines raise an army this time, and they come, and they're like, where's Samson? We want him. And the Israelites are terrified because they're living under the thumb of the warrior nation of the Philistines. And they're like, Samson, uh, like, we don't want to conflict with these guys. Like, they want you, 
They want to kill you. They want you. So, yeah, we're going to give them to you. We're going to give you to them. And he's like, okay, sure, give them to me. Get, or give me to them. But, uh, you know, don't kill me yourselves. Just let things roll. Tie me up. So he gets two brand new ropes and ties, gets tied up by the Israelites. And then as he sets, he's set loose, he walks towards the Philistine army. And of course, the Philistine army is like, yeah, yeah. Finally, they see Samson walking towards them, in, you know, in, in bonds. And before they, as, they, as they rush upon him, before they get to him, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson again, and boom, he breaks the bonds like it was burnt flax. That's what it says. So what happens next is what characterized Samson as a great warrior. Uh, as they're rushing towards him and he breaks the ropes, he looks over and he finds the jawbone of a donkey that had been freshly killed. There was a jawbone of donkey laying on the ground, so he grabs that. And as those guys come at him, he starts swinging. And you see all those martial art movies, you know, like, you know, ah, right? Well, Samson does that, right? And as they come at him, one after the other, after the other, after the other, bang, they get hit with a jawbone. One after the other falls, falls. They, they're just, until there are heaps of bodies. And by the end, the Philistines lost a thousand men trying to take down Samson. And they still didn't take him. So what does Samson do? Does Samson recognize that God gave him the strength to do what he did? Actually, he does. Um... Look at, I want you to pay close attention to his attitude. In Judges 15, 18 to 20. Because he was very thirsty, this is after the, right after the battle. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord. You have given your servant this great victory. Must I die now of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Wow. Think about that. If he recognized that God had given him the strength to overcome these enemies, is that a very good response to the creator of heaven and earth who just enabled you to survive the attack of an army? It's not, is it? But what does God do? Despite his issue, despite his attitude, then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called Enhakor, and it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the day of the Philistines. All right, so we have this scenario. What's evident as you hear this? Samson. Samson was a chief among sinners, wasn't he? He was a sinner. He was a sinner because he was a human being with a sinful nature. Sinful nature passed down from Adam. And when we look back into the Old Testament... There's a legacy written about different men that were also sinners that God used. Noah sinned, right? Noah got drunk, lay naked, and things happened. Resulted in a curse being put on Ham. Abraham sinned when he didn't trust God after God told him that his wife Sarah was to bear a son. He didn't believe in God, did he, at that point? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. It's true, but in his, in his sinful flesh, he fell. So he took Sarah's maid, had sex with her, and had the nation of Arabs through her. 
mean, you look what's going on in Israel right now and all the conflict that's taking place. Right? Moses sinned by striking a rock to get water after God told him just to speak to it. King David, he sinned too, right? He had sex with Bathsheba and then ordered that her husband be sent to the front line so he'd be killed. These are four of many examples of people other than Samson that God showed favor to even though they were great sinners. See, Samson was very gifted, but he certainly was not godly. He was strong on the outside, but had no control on the inside. I mean, the scriptures in the stories tell us that Samson was involved with three different women. I know this, this is disturbing. Like, as I'm preparing this, it's like a weight on you. It's like, oh God, this is so terrible. After all these wonderful things that you do, this is how they respond. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Scripture tells us that he was involved with three different women, all of them wrong. The first one was the woman in Timnah that we talked about. The second one was a prostitute that he was sleeping with from Gaza. Interesting, eh? Gaza. And in the third case, it was Delilah, a beautiful woman of the Philistines whom he fell in love with. In each of these stories, Samson disobeys God by getting involved with a Philistine woman. In each case, his enemies try to destroy him. In each case, God has mercy on Samson and turns the situation around and routes in Israel's enemy through him. Wow. Well, look, look at Samson for what it is, for what he is. What is Samson? Samson represents humanity that tries to be righteous in their own strength. You can try all you want to be righteous. And even if you can tame your actions, you're not going to be able to tame the sinful heart that's been passed down to you from Adam you're not going to be able to do it. Bigger men and women in the past, like stronger, more character um, established men and women have tried and failed before you. Truth be told, Samson was a lustful brood of a man who despite his great outward presence was a spiritual pygmy in his inner man. He was a, a very small, weak man in comparison to what he appeared to be on the outside. How could God use him knowing fully well the kind of man that he was? goes against everything we learn from the New Covenant. The teaching of the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, So walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do, you are not to do whatever you want. So in Paul's teachings, it appears that if we are in step with God's Holy Spirit, we will not be walking in sin, and vice versa, if we're walking in step with our fleshly desires, we cannot walk in God's blessing and favor. But we must understand that Samson and the other judges of these historical accounts are meant to be something other than our role models. This is an old covenant story. And the stories of the Old Testament covenant, they point in only one direction. They're pointed towards the cross and the need for an eternal Savior who will rescue. Samson as a human being operated, think of this, he operated in the strongest human strength that a human being could muster. Just like King Solomon, who later operated 
in the greatest human wisdom that a human being could muster. Samson and Solomon had common qualities. Their lives and legacies show us that the strongest or wisest people among us in our own strength are not strong or wise enough to save themselves. See, just as the Israelites continued to fall, they continued to rise and they continued to fall and they continued to rise and they continued to wane because of their sin and their, their it seemed inability to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. They were the ambassador to the nation for the world where they were supposed to show the, the world what it was like to walk with God. That's what they were supposed to do. But they were unable to do it. But all of this, pa- Pastor Clint, what, is, what are you trying to say? Um, what I'm trying to say is all of this is pointing to one place. It is to point us to the fact that we as human beings haven't got the strength to do it on our own, to save ourselves, to be good, to please God on our own, to keep ourselves from being depraved. It's not in you to be good. Yeah, you may have people out there that live good lives, but what goes on in their heart after the doors close and the lights fall? I can tell you every heart has wickedness in it. Wickedness is resident within the heart of humanity because of Adam. And there is no escape from this, no matter how strong you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how wise you are in the ways of this world. You will not be able to overcome that inner man who is deviant and who wanders from the living God. Hmm. See, God didn't give us a man like Samson and say, if you live up to be, if you live up to be like him, you'll be able to do the exploits that he did and create and have great consequences or great, great uh, delivering qualities. You'll be able to take a thousand Philistines. Right? Woo! That'd be great. Army attacks me and Ropes bind me, poof, just like burnt flax. See, God's point is not to give us a man like Samson and say if you live like him, then you'll do exploits like him. No, God's showing us his power that can even work through a little man like Samson in all of his weakness and immorality, and he's able to accomplish his purpose despite the fact that Samson is an utter and complete failure in his flesh. He can do what he wants. He can set the course how he wants. And he can use everything together for good. But, his, but he's not saying the story, in the story of Samson that, hey, we might as well just live it up and do whatever we want to do because God's just going to do whatever he wants anyways. That's not what it's being, is being said here. No, if, if, if you're looking at Samson as a role model, Rip that out of your heart and go, no, he's not a role model for for me to follow. He's a role model to show me what happens when a person relies on their own flesh and tries to serve God's purposes in their own strength. That's what he is. And he's a miserable and utter failure in that, as were other judges. There's no thanksgiving offered by Samson to God for the successes he was given. So, I think we're going to skip forward. You see, God laid Samson down as an example for us to show us that because of our sins, Israel, and for that matter, everybody needs deliverance. And, And And our propensity is to turn to other things to help us in that deliverance. 
to turn to idols. What's your idol? What, does, what tempts you to turn and, and, and give your life to outside of Christ? That's an idol. Like Israel, Samson was shown the glory and the delivering power of God again and again only to reject what he'd been shown and to go back into sinning again and disregarding God. See, the women that Samson was so, Samson was so enraptured by were not his friends. The Philistines, folks, are not your friends. The Bible says that in the spiritual realm, there are spiritual Philistines that are bent on our, our destruction. They want to occupy our land. They want to destroy us. They want to render us ineffective and unproductive. They want to rule over us. And the Philistines, in the case of us, are not, you know, the Russians or the whatevers. People on the other side of the world that have a different ideology than us. That's not our enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and high places. You see, you are wrestling against spiritual foes who want your destruction. And you can't com compromise your life and get into league with the Philistines because what's going to happen to you is gonna, what's going to happen to Samson in the physical, in the spiritual, you might think, I'm strong enough to handle all these Philistine things and I can have a few games along the way and maybe play a few jokes and have some fun. What's the harm in that? Guess what? The problem with sin, a little sin doesn't stay little. You invite the Philistines into your camp, folks, and you will find out very soon that they're going to overcome you and put you in bondage. Samson digressed. He digressed and he digressed and he digressed. He digressed. He denied his Nazarite vows. He fell into temptation. He got his eyes on the Philistine woman. What's the temptation? Well, for him, it was the Philistine, beautiful Philistine woman. Oh, she's such a gorgeous woman. Got his eyes on her. And because he got his eyes on her, he began to trust that she had his best interest in mind. And as soon as he gave his heart over to her and opened up the secret to his strength to her, what did she do? Did she support him and love him and go, oh yeah, I'll stand with you, Samson? No, in Delilah's case, she automatically went, chiching, now we got him. So in the middle of the night, while he's sleeping, he told her the secret to his strength was in his Nazarite vows, what he was telling her. If you cut my hair, I'll lose my strength. So in the middle of the night while he's sleeping, the Philistine woman invites the Philistine man to come and they go, tink, 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 tink. And they cut his hair off and he jumps up to overcome the Philistines that were in the room there with him and guess what? His strength was gone. And because his eyes were on the wrong things, his eyes were put out. They gouged his eyes out. And they put him in chains and led him away as a laughing stock and as a spectacle. This is what the devil and the demonic hordes out there want to do to you. You get your eyes off of Jesus and you start walking in a way that seems right unto you. And you start to compromise and you invite the Philistines into your life, into your camp. You compromise with them and you, you get into bed with them and then all of a sudden, before you know it, your eyes are gouged out and you're being led away in chains with them mocking you and making a spectacle of you. That's the way of the devil. That's why the Bible says, there's a way that seems right into a man but it only leads to death therein. So, folks, okay. <laughs> this story is to show us that in ourselves, if we try to do the right things and follow God, we're not going to do it. So, you notice when the angel of the Lord came to Samson's parents before he was born, what did they say? What did the angel of the Lord say? The angel of the Lord is who? We talked about last week. 
Who's the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. The angel of the Lord is a theophany. It's a Christophany. He's the one that accepted the sacrifice of Manoah and went up in the flame. The angel of the Lord said in chapter 13, 5, that Samson will begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Why did that word begin get put in there? Because he wouldn't do it. The author is unintentionally telling, or intentionally, I think, intentionally, telling us that for the end of this story, you're going to have to look beyond this story. And for those of us who know the end of the big story, it should be obvious. You see, Samson was granted a request by God that the Philistines paraded him into the temple of Dagon and he, got, and he asked to be put against the pillars and then he prayed, God, give me one last feat of strength so that I can take this whole corrupt kingdom down with as much as you give me. God answered his request. They were going to kill him anyways. So he, he wanted to, he asked God for mercy to be able to do some good for his people while he died instead of just being died, just being executed and tortured in front of them. They had, had him there for their entertainment. I'm sure they were doing all kinds of funny, funny stuff to him, mocking him. So he God prays to God, and God gives him strength, and he pushes down the pillars. The temple comes down. More Philistines are taken out by that event than in, in all the other events to take together. But that wasn't the end of the story. You see, the Philistines still ruled the land. The big story is this. You see, Jesus completes the salvation in the spiritual that Samson could only start with Israel in the physical. The entirety of the Old Testament points to the necessity of Jesus Christ coming and giving himself as a sacrifice on a cross And he dies so that we don't have to die. He takes our sins upon his shoulders so that we are no longer bound by the chains of sin like Samson was. He takes our sins out of our spirit and casts them as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. And then he does something even more awesome than that. God didn't save us just to leave us. God didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us to move away. Jesus died so that the Holy Spirit of the Most High could come and take residence inside of us. And that is the, that is the answer to what Samson was trying to do in his own strength. He failed. But Jesus did not fail. The law of God was given through Israel to show us how utterly unable and helpless we are as human beings to save ourselves and that we need God to rescue us from our miserable bondage to our miserable enemies. In the case of Samson and and, and the judges, that's the parallel. In the spiritual, the giving of God's law to Moses was only the start of deliverance, just as... Samson was just the start of Israel's physical deliverance, which was actually pointing us to the need of something greater. Like the physical Israelites were bound, we have to come to the place where we understand our need for deliverance, our need for a savior. I'm not strong enough, I'm not wise enough to be saved on my own strength, on my own merit. You see, the principalities and the powers of the spiritual Philistines will overcome us unless God helps us. Like Samson, Moses started the deliverance process, but he was not able to enter the promised land to finish it. It was Jesus, the great I am, who needed to finish it. Jesus, the angel of the Lord who visited Samson's parents, The one who was fully God and that he created the universe, but he was born of a virgin and became a man so that he could take our place 
for what we were unable to do in our own strength and wisdom, the Lord Jesus Christ did for us what we could never do. I had a debt I could not pay. I owed a debt. I, or how'd that go? I owed a debt I could not pay. He owed. No. How, can someone sing that for me? He, Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. I owed a debt that I could not pay. And Jesus paid a debt for me. In Romans chapter 8, 3 to 4, the apostle Paul puts it this way. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. And if we turn back a chapter into Romans 7, Paul says in Romans 7, 4 to 6, So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore the fruit for death. But now, by dying to what was once, what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. So you can see this is the story. The story of Samson birth, Samson's birth parallels Jesus' birth, right? Both were promised. Both were miraculously conceived. Both were answers to Israel's bondage. Both stories skip straight from birth to adulthood. It's like Samson's story was a premonition of the truer, wiser, and better judge in Jesus Christ. See? This story points away from Samson. It points away from him and it points, points to Jesus Christ. Jesus was the strong man who would succeed in every place that Samson failed. Like Samson, his strength would reside in us. See? The Spirit of Christ lives in us. But there's a difference doesn't come upon us just in one little instant here and there. You are a new creation in Christ when you accept Christ into your, into your heart. When God comes in and makes his resident within you, he's no longer having just to come upon you. He lives within you. And if the spirit of Christ who lives within you is resident there, then there is then sin has lost its power. We don't have to sin any longer. We don't have to follow the path of Samson any longer. Not saying that we don't sometimes, sometimes we fail. But God wants us to see that sin is no longer our master and we don't have to obey it because he set us free. See, humanity needs someone to empower their spirits for change, but not simply stir the imagination. <laughs> These stories are great if they're taken the right way. If we believe what Jesus did for us, then he was strong, became weak for us. He who became rich, or who was rich in the beginning, became poor for us. He who is righteous took the sin of all of us on his shoulders. The life himself underwent death so that we in turn could have life in him. Samson was a Nazarite, right? And he couldn't keep his vow. 
So my friends, we can all be thankful that we stand in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene who took all of our sin upon his shoulders and set us free. And that is why Samson points to Jesus in every respect. And that is why when we look at the Bible and we look at the Old Testament, we need to look for the, for the arrow pointing to the Lord Jesus on the cross. And when we read the New Testament, after Christ came and ascended, we need to look at the arrow pointing back to the cross. Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the great I Am. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we know that you've got lessons for us to learn. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for teaching us how unable we are to save ourselves. Thank you for giving yourself on the cross so that we could have life, so that we don't have to be bound by the Philistine chains of spiritual bondage. We praise you. And I ask God that your grace and peace would rest upon these people as they go their separate ways, as they go throughout their week. Bless them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.